I'm, it seems like we've been at this for a while. This is a burning issue across the state, but no place is it more important than the city of Detroit. To me, it's one of the fundamental civil rights issues facing this state. In Michigan, you either uh, pay for the most expensive and comprehensive insurance in America, or you drive without coverage. And 20% of Michigan residents, the highest in the United States, are driving uninsured. And for those folks, they have nothing uh, when they get in an accident. Uh, the chair has asked me not to talk about a particular bill, but to discuss PIP, which is, you know, one of the things the Governor Whitmer said last night was, uh, I don't want to sign something that doesn't actually solve the problem. The worst thing any of us could do is pass a bill telling people their car insurance is going to go down, and then six months later have them get a bill and see that we didn't tell them the truth. And the fact is, the money is in PIP, and that's been the sticking point and why this hasn't been able to be dealt with. And so um, I, I know many of you, but some of you who may not know, I ran the Detroit Medical Center for nine years. I was on the other side of this issue. I was on the MHA Executive Committee. I never thought I'd see the MHA take the extreme position they've taken uh, the last few years. Uh, but I understand this from both sides. And let me, if you're not familiar with it, I want to show you why PIP is so costly and why it's driving our costs. In 1972, this legislature passed no fault. And the promise was it was going to lower our rates. That was the whole point of doing it. Uh, and the debate was fascinating. Lee Iacocca was running Chrysler, and, and he was saying uh, collision repairs are too expensive because of all these lawsuits. Nobody's talking about health care. And the trial lawyers fought this tooth and nail because they believed the lawsuits over who was at fault was going to go away. Interesting uh, how the positions have changed uh, over time. But here's a typical uh, editorial when no fault was passed. 17% of all the lawsuits in Michigan were auto accidents. 17% is clogging our courts. We wish we had the day that 17% were car accidents, as I'll show you. It's going to be no more uh, negotiations of court cases to find fault. All these billboards you see, better than our car accident, call me. Nobody in 1972 would have believed that could happen. They thought they got rid of car lawsuits. We're going to drop the premiums. Young single drivers are going to be able to afford coverage. That was the promise when no fault was passed. You know what there was no discussion of? Medical costs. Because in 1972, your medical costs from car accidents weren't paid for by your car insurance. So when you look at this, everything was about we got to make stronger bumpers because of the collision costs. Only 6% of your car insurance premium in 1972 was medical costs. Nobody dreamed they were making no fault into a medical payment system because you were covered by your employer, it might be Blue Cross or Health Alliance plan, you might be on Medicare, Medicaid, VA, and for 300,000 drivers who didn't have health care, they paid $45 into what was called the uninsured motorist fund. And it was accepted. You got in a car accident, you went to the hospital, your employer or Medicare or Medicaid paid your health care, which is the way it works in the other 49 states. So today, what makes up the cost of car insurance? About 7% of your premium, you can pull out your bill, you go home tonight and you'll see this, 7% of your premium is called bodily injury. It's an injury to your passenger or a serious injury to a driver in another car. About 19% of your bill is theft. About 32% is damage to your car. Far and away the largest percentage, 42% of what people in Michigan are paying are for the medical bills. PIP and MCCA, and the great majority of that is PIP. It was 6% of the bills in 1972. It's now 42% of the bill. This is why Michigan's car insurance premiums are the highest in America. So how do PIP and MCCA work? So PIP is personal injury protection. If I'm a driver and I go to the hospital, PIP pays my medical bills. If I'm in a wheelchair, PIP pays my medical bills for the rest of my life. MCCA is what covers it once my bills run above $550,000. And so now people in Michigan are paying $192. Usually it's $170 to $180, but they're paying $192 for those cases over $550,000. But in Detroit, for example, $2,000 is PIP and $192 is MCCA. The vast majority of these health care costs, there aren't that many cases that are over $550. It's PIP, that's where the costs are. So how does it work? 91% of the Michigan residents today have health care. 
Uh, after uh, the legislature passed Healthy Michigan, we opened the exchanges under the Affordable Care Act. So 91% of our residents already have health care coverage. And so if you fall off a ladder today and you end up breaking your neck and need long-term care for the rest of your life, 91% of the people would be covered under that. The other 9% would ultimately end up on Medicaid as disabled. So for the 91% who have health care coverage today, when you go buy coverage a second time with your car insurance, you're paying for double coverage. That's essentially what PIP does. It says, I don't care if you have a Blue Cross policy. I don't care if you're a UAW retiree who has health care for life. I don't care. You have to buy it a second time with your car insurance. And so there are only 12 states in America that make you buy PIP. 38 states say you can, retire and you can rely entirely on your own health care coverage. And if you want to buy something, you can. 38 states have no requirement to buy PIP. 12 states require you to buy PIP. Utah requires you to buy $3,000 worth. Kansas, $4,500, you can see. Kentucky, $10,000. What that means is this. If I'm a driver in Kentucky and I get in a car accident, I go to the hospital. The first $10,000 is paid by my car insurance premium, and everything else goes to my regular coverage. And so as you look at the different states, you get up to New York says you've got to buy $50,000, New Jersey says you have to buy 250,000 medical with your car insurance. The only state in America that says you have to buy unlimited coverage for everything for the rest of your life is Michigan. And that is the crux of what's brought us to where we are today. And so here's what we did. When we passed a law that says you have to buy unlimited medical coverage with your car insurance, we shifted the health care costs away from Blue Cross with your employer, away from Medicare, away from Medicaid, and we stuck it on the poor suckers that are writing the premium checks. We shifted the entire medical cost to them. Uh, and it drove up the cost in an amazing way. And this is an important thing to understand is the difference between primary and secondary coverage. Pretty much everybody's private insurance says we're secondary. If anybody else is paying, we don't. We're secondary. And so, if you have coverage from employer plan or Medicare or Medicaid, they only pay if somebody else isn't available. So when Michigan stepped in and said, you're going to buy unlimited coverage with your car insurance, guess what? We became primary. And so every employer, every Medicare program, every Medicaid program, every VA program didn't have to pay because instead we said, we'll have our Michigan residents. It was really nice, VA, that you were going to cover me, but our Michigan residents will pay for it anyway, even if you are a veteran. And so what we've seen in the state of Michigan is a massive shift in the cost of medical payments from employers and from federal government uh, onto individual ratepayers. Here's the people who get hurt the hardest, senior citizens. I'm 65 years old. I've earned Medicare. In the other 49 states, if I got in a car accident, Medicare would pay for my hospitalization. Medicare would pay for my long-term coverage. I earned that in my life. The only state in America that doesn't allow our seniors to use their Medicare is Michigan because Medicare is secondary. And so uh, Jennifer Granholm, when she was governor, went to the feds and tried to fix this. She said, hey, uh, Medicare ought to pay for this. Our seniors shouldn't be socked with these bills. And, and the federal government, CMS, ruled no. You have unlimited coverage in your no-fault statute. We're secondary. And so senior citizens in Michigan, I don't care what part of the state you're in, senior citizens in Michigan who are driving are paying $800 to $1,000 a year in medical coverage that in all other 49 states we paid for by the federal government. We shifted the cost from the federal government to our seniors. And at least in Detroit, we got a whole lot of seniors that could do something with $800 to 1000 bucks a year. Uh, that they shouldn't have to be paying. And this is the aggravating thing. Everybody knows this. And yet, because of the forces against this, and I'll show you why, we haven't been able to fix it. So, okay, I used to run a hospital, and you ask the question, well, if the senior was going to get paid on Medicare, why is MHA and the long-term care providers, CPAN and like, why are they fighting so hard? If they're going to get paid anyway by Medicare. Why do they keep fighting for unlimited PIP? Well, there was another problem. 
in the 1972 Act. The 1972 law said that doctors, hospitals, long-term care providers can charge their usual and customary charges. That was the way the world worked in 1972. Hospitals, doctors, providers could charge whatever they want. There was no HMO. There was no PPO. They could charge anything. We enshrined that into the law 47 years ago. And in the last 47 years, everybody in America has eliminated usual and customary charges where hospitals and care providers could, could charge whatever they want, except one. Car owners in the state of Michigan are the only people in America still paying hospitals usual and customary charges because we can't get out of the 1972 law. And so you want to know why they're fighting you so darn hard? How much could it possibly be, right? So let me show you the difference between Medicare, Commercial, Blue Cross, and no fault. One hour physical therapy, same room, same therapist. If you're on Medicare and you're going in from 12 to 1, and you take care of that senior, the therapist gets 31 bucks for that hour. If you're on Blue Cross, the next hour, the therapist has a good time, $42. I guarantee you those office managers absolutely know who those Blue Cross patients are and get them in as fast as possible. But if you're in on auto no fault, the next person gets paid $79 for an hour of care. You see why these long-term care providers are fighting so darn hard to keep this in place? I was in the hospital business. We would fight to get a Blue Cross patient at $42. But boy, a no-fault patient at $79? CT scans are even better. Uh, Medicare, $262. Blue Cross, same machine, same clinic, $419. But no-fault, you get $1,800. Those no-fault people are booked first day every time you can. And MRIs, $484 Medicare pays, same machine, same radiologist, and no false paying $3,259. It is absolutely morally indefensible. And this is why they are fighting tooth and nail. This is what is driving these ridiculous premiums in this state. Well, now that explains the medical providers. Why are the trial lawyers fighting? Well, the trial lawyers well, didn't want the no fault statute in the first place. You've got to give these trial lawyers credit. These guys are a genius. Uh, let me show you what they have managed to do. Okay, so I showed you what the, the costs are. So this is the costs that make up uh, no fault today. Bodily injury and tort was where trial lawyers should be suing, where somebody is at fault in an accident, another driver got hurt. The Mark Bernsteins of the world, these people are litigating whose fault it is. But the trial lawyers looked at this, and this is why they're fighting. We don't want to only sue over 7% of the pot. There's not enough money here. That's why they opposed it. And then they looked out and said, there's 42% down there. How do we get in on that? And a group of trial lawyers have created an entirely new practice of law. They're suing over the medical bills. And this has been just unbelievable to watch. Uh, but here's what happens. They figured out that a third of the 7% doesn't get me very much, but a third of the 42%, that's a lot of money. And so how does it work? Well. If I'm in a car accident tomorrow, and I'm personally covered by AAA, I get taken to Detroit Receiving Hospital. They do a great job for me, and uh, receiving, I probably run up $30,000 worth of bills. Within a couple of days, whether it's by scouring police reports or contacts in the emergency room or, room or whatever, I am going to have an insurance helper call me. It will absolutely happen. And my insurance helper is going to call me and say, you might have some claims. Let me get you to my lawyer. And here's what the lawyer does. The lawyer says, you're insured by AAA. AAA hasn't paid your bill. The lawyer files a suit against AAA and says, you haven't paid your bill. AAA says, I don't have a bill. It's seven days after the accident. Receiving doesn't even send a bill for 30 days. How could I pay a bill I've never seen? The, uh, 30 days later, receiving sends the bill for AAA. AAA writes a $30,000 check, but they don't send it to receiving like they used to. They send it to the lawyer who has a lien. The lawyer takes 10,000 bucks off the top. The lawyer then sends $20,000 to receiving. Now receiving says, what the hell? I, you know, it was a $10,000 deal anyway. I billed 30 because it was triple. I got double. Uh, life is good. And so the higher they run up the medical bills, the more the lawyers take a third of the money. And if you get one of these tragic cases 
where somebody is going to need a lifetime worth of care, the lawyers are taking a third of the medical payments for the rest of their lives. They've got lifetime annuities. You see all these billboards and these TV ads. In many cases, they are being paid for by your car insurance premiums. So now we've got this unholy alliance where we have a group of lawyers and a group of medical providers, and it's in their interest to run these bills up as high as they can because they both benefit. So you say, okay. But Detroiters are paying $4,000 a year, and most of the rest of the state is paying $2,500. How does this explain why Detroiters are paying more? And this is the hardest part for me to get my mind around, but PIP is driving what we call redlining. And we learned this because in 1990, the NAACP filed suit against AAA. And they said, AAA, you are charging Detroit drivers twice suburban drivers. It's obviously redlining. AAA went to court, and they proved that Detroiters were filing medical claims twice as often as suburbanites. That, in fact, it was Michigan's no-fault law that was doing it, and NAACP lost the suit. And I didn't believe it, so we did our own analysis when I first got here. And here's what our independent analysis showed in 2012, because I was ready to go after AAA too. But here's what it showed, that suburbanites get in car accidents, eight drivers per thousand. In any given year, eight suburbanites out of a thousand will get in a car accident. Detroiters get in car accidents, eight per thousand. It's identical. Detroit drivers are exactly as good or as bad as suburban drivers. So you say, well, where does the redlining come from? Then you look at the medical claims. Suburban drivers file about five PIP claims per thousand drivers. Detroit drivers file 12. Even though we're in the same number of accidents, Detroit drivers are filing twice as many medical claims. And when we do, on the collision side, our costs are the same. But suburban drivers have an average of a $30,000 PIP medical bill. Detroit drivers are having an average of a $60,000 medical bill. And you say, how can this be with the same number of accidents? But if you're in the culture of Detroit, you would see it. Uh, Detroiters have been actively solicited and encouraged to get as much treatment as possible. Uh, and so you can't go in our city without seeing billboards saying, been in a car accident, call us. And here's our problem. We will never win a redlining suit because the insurance companies can prove that they are charging rates based on the number of medical claims filed. And as long as the lawyers can make a third of all this stuff, and as long as the hospitals can make all this profit, they'll keep doing it. Now, here's the good news. The pain of Detroit is now starting to be shared with the rest of you. Uh, because these lawyers have extended their practice beyond Detroit borders to a bunch of other communities. Uh, and to my friends in Macomb County, which now has the fastest rise in car insurance uh, in Michigan, uh, there is a certain amount of justice in what is occurring. Uh, but they found it so lucrative, they don't have to stick to Detroit. But let me just show you what happened. In Wayne County Circuit Court, the number of no-fall cases based on the total percentage of our cases. In 2010, there were 5,600 car accidents, lawsuits filed in Wayne County, 39% of the docket. By now, it's up to 57% of the docket. You talk to our Wayne County Circuit judges all day long. They are doing nothing but medical bill lawsuits uh, so they can take a third of, of AAA's medical bills. It's clogging up the court. But here's the good news as far as I'm concerned. Here's in Wayne County, it went from 39 to 57. In Macomb County, it's jumped in seven years. It's doubled. 52% of all the lawsuits in Macomb County are now car accident lawsuits. These guys, these lawyers have taken their, their game out to Macomb County. And while well, they haven't gotten as high as we are in rates, the trend line is headed our direction. Some of the people who smugly dismissed this three or four years ago aren't quite so comfortable. Washtenaw County is now up to 52% of all the cases there. Oakland, yeah, they got it good. Brooks Patterson's okay. It's only 33. It's only tripled in the last seven years. They're still at 33%. Kent County is now up to 30% of all the lawsuits filed. Now, in 1972, this state said 70% of cases are car accidents are clogging the court system. Today, 42% of every civil circuit court lawsuit in the state of Michigan is a car accident. 
the massive amount of public resources we are wasting in our court system is unbelievable. And I think that's a part of the reason now uh, that we're starting to see the conversations that we're having. Uh, and so here's the results. Uh, you can go on insure.com today. 2018, they just published a report. Six straight year, Michigan has the highest car insurance in America. But you look at the states around us, we're at 2400 bucks. Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, Ohio, at $1,000. And every one of you who represents a border city knows that you've got houses in your city with a Wisconsin or an Indiana or an Ohio license plate because folks are registering their cars in the neighboring state. They're, they're exercising choice now whether it's, it's appropriate or not. How many years are we going to let this happen? And if somebody wants to say, let's eliminate the non-driving factors, I'm in favor of that. Okay, I think credit scores ought to be out. I think we ought to, marital status ought to be out. But if all you do is eliminate those factors, everybody in Michigan pays the highest car insurance in America. Okay? I mean, we do need to eliminate the inequities. It doesn't solve the problem because the problem is PIP. And so when we talk about PIP choice, because right now you have to buy comprehensive coverage for everything, no choice at all. Who could possibly be against PIP choice? If you want to know how it works, something that some of you are going to have different opinions on, but I come back to Obamacare. When the Affordable Care Act passed, we said Americans should have a choice of the kind of coverage they get on the exchange. Twelve million Americans in this country bought health care coverage on the exchange through the Affordable Care Act. And members of my party celebrated that as a great success. But let me show you how it works. If you haven't been on the Michigan Exchange now, and, and you can do it, we have 300,000 Michigan residents who are on the exchange who bought health care. You have choices. You can get bronze. You can get silver. You can get gold. You can get platinum. We give folks choices so they can buy something. We don't say you have to buy platinum or you can't participate in the exchange. Nobody would think that that's rational. And so I want to show you how the Affordable Care Act works in Michigan. Today on the exchange in Michigan, we have nine insurers with 85 different health plan options. So I just picked one out at random. For 2019, a 55-year-old non-smoker, if you were to go onto the Affordable Care Act Exchange today to sign up for coverage, here's what you'd see. And I just picked out a few of them. There's 85 choices, but you could have bronze plan. Meridian Health uh, gets you $392 for healthy individuals at a, at a low-cost plan, and there's some choices. Then there's a silver plan, and you could choose from the different providers in the 600s. And then there's a gold plan, where it can range from... 600 900 or if you want to get something that looks like traditional Blue Cross, it's $1,184. Those are the ranges you get today. Nobody passed a law saying you had to buy the $1,184 policy or you can't participate in the exchange. So when you gave Michigan residents choices, our 300,000 newly insured residents did this. 25% bought bronze, 68%, this is today, have silver, and 7% have gold. This is what happens when you give Michigan residents choices and they buy their own health care. Now, I would ask who here would propose amending the exchange so you could only buy the $1,100 comprehensive coverage or you're kicked out? Because 90% of those folks would drop their health care coverage. Nobody would rationally say we're going to take choice away from residents on health care on the Affordable Care Act exchanges. And yet, that's exactly what the PIP law does in this state. It says we can't trust you to make a choice to buy what you can afford. We're going to mandate the most expensive insurance in America. And so that's why last Friday, some of you may know, I filed a lawsuit uh, a few months back declaring the law unconstitutional. And it's pretty interesting. In 19... 72, when the law passed, the trial lawyers filed a suit to declare it unconstitutional. In a case called Shavers versus Attorney General, the Michigan Supreme Court ruled no fault, as it was in, uh, implemented, was constitutionally deficient. The Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional in 78 because the rates weren't fair and equitable. They stopped the law for 18 months and told the legislature to go back and fix the rates. We've got an ironic situation. I've taken the precedent that the trial lawyer has established, and I've gone to court and said, Judge, you tell me the rates are fair and equitable for residents today. Nobody could have dreamed we had hit this point. And on Friday, well, the judge didn't rule, and the attorney general, who was very competent, 
their argument, they couldn't defend the system. They just basically said, Judge, you should make a state judge throw it out, not a federal judge. That was essentially the AG's argument. The federal judge called Michigan's No Fault Act shameful and indicated he will get personally engaged in settlement if the Michigan legislators want to act. Uh, I think that sent some shockwaves, because anybody who thought this was some kind of frivolous suit now knows we've got a suit based on Michigan Supreme Court precedent, and the very first hearing the judge has called the act shameful that I've asked him to invalidate. And so that's where we sit today. I would much prefer to work through the legislative process and do something so that my residents uh, who right now can't get to their jobs, can't get to school, can't get to see relatives because they can't afford car insurance. Uh, I would much prefer to see my residents get relief uh, by action of the state legislature, which is why I'm here. But if not, we're going we're gonna to push in federal court. And with that, Madam Chair, I'd be glad to take any questions.